I know Tanya's got one, and if Tanya would like to come forward, and David. Well, everybody knows what happens at the end of January. Every year, we're always working towards the same theme, and if you're from the US, where's Fran? End of January, early February is Super Bowl. And I know you know that, and if you didn't get a flyer on your way in, you need to know because Super Bowl for us is next week. We're actually having it a little bit earlier and if you turn up at this time next week, we'll already be halfway through. You'll be at the halftime break and you would have already missed the kickoff. All right, so kickoff is at 9.30, so you need to be here for the kickoff, not at the end of the game or at half time. Now, it's going to be an awesome Sabbath. We're actually running it as part of the, of the Sabbath school team, kicking off with breakfast at 9.30. And you can see on your flyer a little bit of the outline. We've got a panel discussion based around the lesson that's been happening. And then we're kicking into small groups after that and some food later. So please do not be late next week. Tan, you got some more? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a couple of things that go with this, you can see the fourth line down on the screen there says disciples and scripture. The topic that the panel is going to be opening up for us is found on the Adventist.org website where you go each week to look up your Sabbath school lesson and it was actually the topic for the first week of this quarter. So the one to look for is the one called disciples and scripture. The panel will be discussing that and when we move into small groups in the second half of the game, that's where you and I and everyone in our little group will get a chance to look up some Bible texts and to have some discussion about various aspects of what it means to be a disciple, to disciple others with scripture. So that's the topic we'll be talking about. How many of you came at the end of last year to the very first one that we ran, the combined one? Let's see your hands. 
quite a few. We had an awesome time. The food was fantastic and uh, we had a really great morning. So this time we're going to do a few of these this year. We're going to combine the church service in and it's going to run through as a combined Bible study for the entire morning. Breakfast will be awesome. Um, I know the Finches are onto that in particular and thank you in advance. Um, it will be great. So please, it's a program for both children and families and Tanya, you want to talk to them about that? Yep. Parents and children are most welcome to come to the program and it would be great to bring the kids to breakfast. We would love to have them there with us. Then the kids will go to Sabbath school because that's their children's Sabbath school because that's running as normal. And in the second half of the program, there will be childcare for them to allow parents to come and join in with the small groups if they wish. So kids are most welcome. Please bring them along. All right, so Super Bowl Sabbath next week, 9.30... Make sure that you're here. You don't need to have breakfast before you leave home because you're going to have it when you arrive. It's also Australia Day the next day. If you would like to wear something Australian, something green and gold, something blue, white and red, that would be terrific too. Thanks, everyone. Well, thank you, Tanya and Dave, for the tremendous uh, work that you guys put into our Sabbath School program. It really is appreciated. Um, and we're looking forward to that. Is there any other announcements? No quick ones. Thanks, Jeremy. I won't keep you long. Just wanted to let you know, um, this last month, after the long, hard sweat and tears of our church members working hard, we finally got the internet up for our live streaming. So um, last week we had our first pilot, which was a success, with a bit of tweaking, but um, today we're on again. And even if you view it on your phones, you can actually see uh, the service being broadcast live as we speak. So um, this is just another form of outreach, um, um, part of the church's vision. So uh, if you know anyone who is interested, maybe they, uh, they're thinking about coming to church or maybe they're in a situation where they can't come to church and they're sick, uh, they can view it on the website. Wonderful. Yeah. And we know that if you're watching your phones, watching the sermon on your phone, you're sitting in the pews, but you're going like this, you're actually not watching the sermon. So, any other announcements? Thank you. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Thanks for coming to church this week. Um, we've got a lot of church members who have come in. At 11 o'clock, the church was sort of empty. So, um, it's filled up nicely. So, it's nice to see you all come back refreshed after your holidays, perhaps. And we've got some visitors here with their children, so I can see you over there. Thank you for coming. Hope you have a happy Sabbath. And it's nice to see Sheldon here with her friend. Sheldon's a big sister to baby Isabel Rose, so we're all happy about that, and I bet she is too. So I hope they're doing well at home this week. Um, so we pray that um, Grego will give a good sermon and um, we'll feel God's presence here with us this day. So um, thanks for coming and have a happy day. It's time for offering, so could the deacons come forward and we'll have a, a word of prayer. And um, it's local offering today, so just one bag, so just don't worry about where you put it, just shove the whole wallet in, in the purse, shove it all in. Okay, if we could just bow our heads and we'll have a short word of prayer. Father God, we are so thankful, Lord, that we live in this wonderful country. We thank you, Lord, that very soon we celebrate Australia Day, but really this is a Christian day every day because you are our saviour, you are our God, you are our guide and our strength. We thank you for what you've given us. In our, we all have a roof over our heads and we have food on the table and clothes on our backs. And we, we thank you, Lord, that you bless us even though sometimes we do wrong. We thank you that you forgive us. We thank you, Lord, that you cherish us more than anything in the world. And we ask, Lord, that you guide and direct us in this week that we have ahead. We ask, Lord, that you direct us in our giving, that when we give, we'll be able to help others, but in that we also receive from you. So we thank you, Lord, for what we have, and we ask that you 
uh, help us to give as we can. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It's story time for the children. Come on down. Come and sit on the stairs and we'll tell a story. I'll read a story, actually. <laughs> Good to have visitors. Have a seat on the stairs. Goody gum. I didn't know we were having kids today, but they all came. Thanks for coming. My name's Pam. What's your name? Grace. Grace. What's your name? Josiah. Josiah. I'm Asha. What? Asha. Asha. G'day. Abby. Abby. Zara. Zara. Jane. JJ. Eliza. Erelia. Erelia. <laughs> What's your name? No, don't lick it. What's your name? Tell me, okay. What's his name? That's Lockie. What's your name? What's her name? That's Brianna down here. And that's... What's her name? Liliana. Liliana. Hello. Come for a story? Okay. Let's get going. This story is called Are All the Watchers Safe? Like TikTok watches. Oh, here's another little boy. Lockie's brother. Ryan. This story is about Corrie Ten Boom. She lived in a little watch shop in the middle of Holland, over in Europe, a long way from us. She lived there with her mother, father and sister, Betsy. It was a pretty little shop with a sign by the door. The windows were full of watches that ticked away gently. In the background, the clocks made loud ringing sounds. There's some pictures. But there's a picture up on the screen of the actual shop on the corner, I think, with the blue awning. Is that right, Shannon? So that's Corrie. Yeah, that's the, the watch shop. This is from many years ago. Corrie loved her father. He was one of the best watchmakers in the city. Corrie's father loved God and he loved to teach his little girls about him too. Corrie felt safe, felt safe with her father. She felt even safer when she knew that God loved her. It was wonderful know, to know that loving and trusting in Jesus was all she needed to do. Corrie wanted to be a watchmaker like her father. When she passed her watchmaker's exams, Corrie's family had a big celebration. Corrie was so pleased. She loved working in the shop and every evening she made sure that the doors were locked. Are all the watches safe? She always wanted to know if the watches were safe at night. Her father would say, yes, everything is safe, Corrie. When, then one day, Corrie and Betsy woke up to the sound of aeroplanes flying overhead. They ran to the window and looked out. Enemy planes co covered the sky. The Nazis had invaded Holland. So there was a war, World War II. Their country was at war. The bombs were dropping from the sky day and night until Holland was defeated. There's a picture there in the book. 
just the planes flying over. Um, <clears throat> what's next? Corrie did all she could to help people escape from the enemy. Corrie would cycle through the city to pass on secret messages. Jewish people were in lots of danger. Many of them were put in prison. We must help these poor people, Corrie said. They need somewhere to hide. So what will we do? Let's find a safe place for them. So what did they do? That's when Corrie's room was made into a hiding place. There's a picture there in Corrie's bedroom. A special secret room was added on to the end of her bedroom. Anybody who needed a place to hide could come and stay with the Ten Boom family. When the enemy came, Corrie and Betsy would hide the people in the secret room until the soldiers went away. See, were they crawling into a small room? Sometimes they'd hide there for many days or even weeks and the family would feed them. Um, when danger was over, Corrie would whisper a prayer of thanks to God and, um, because everyone was safe, safe and, God would, and she would thank God for that. However, one day the enemy found out that Corrie's family were helping Jews escape and they were hiding them. Nazi guards came to watch the shop and hammer on the door. Corrie's friends hid inside the secret room. They got in just in time. A Nazi guard marched forward and into the watch shop and took Corrie away. It was her turn to go to prison now because she was hiding the Jews. It was a horrible and frightening day, but as she left in the back of, in the back of an army truck, Corrie thanked God that the Nazis had found the secret room had not found the secret room, I should say. Her friends were still safe. So they still didn't know about the secret room. So that was good. The prison was a horrible place to be in. There she is in prison, not looking very happy. Corrie was all alone. Her family were in prison too, but she wasn't allowed to see them. So they were in different areas. She was tired and hungry and very sad. When she heard that her father had died, Corrie's eyes filled with tears, but she knew that he had gone home to be with Jesus. That's what heaven is like, she thought. It's just like going home. Father is safe now because he's with Jesus. Corrie was surprised one morning when a parcel arrived for her. Why is the address written so strangely? It's almost as if they want me to look under the stamp because they wrote her name and there was a little arrow written to point to the stamp. Um, so she thought, oh, well, I better op have a look under the stamp. So she quietly peeled and carefully peeled the stamp back to see what message was there. And the message under the stamp, it's a secret message. It said, all the watchers are safe. So that was a secret message, meaning all the Jews were safe still in their little locked closet at home. So Corrie was happy then. It's a secret message to tell her that the people in the secret room had escaped, so they'd actually escaped. Thank you, Jesus, Corrie whispered. Thank you for keeping them safe. So that's wonderful. Corrie spent many months in different prisons. One of these prisons was called Ravensbrook. For some of that time, she was with her sister, Betsy, but when Betsy died, Corrie was on her own. However, Corrie knew that God was with her. Even if she died, God would keep her safe. Corrie knew that there was no place safer than heaven. But they had to work while they were in prison. <clears throat> then an amazing thing happened. An enemy guard made a mistake and called Corrie's um, number. When they go into prison, they were given a special number. And they called Corrie's number, so she was soon freed from prison. But it was a mistake, but anyway, she got away. Corrie remembered the watches and secret room and how God always keeps his people safe. So many people need to know that the only way to be really safe is to trust in Jesus Christ. Jesus died for me. That is what I will tell the world, Corrie said. Trusting in Jesus and, that's, and what he did is the only way to be truly safe. And so she did um, come out of prison and she lived to be a very old lady. And um, she did trust in Jesus all her life. And there's a picture. In, that's the little room inside the house, that secret room where the people hid for safety until they were 
they could get out where it was going to be safe for them. See how small that room is? There might have been one, two or three people in there at a time. So that was a secret room and they weren't found. So God was watching over them. So we're lucky we have a God that watches over us and keeps us safe, aren't we? Well, thank you for coming to hear the story of Corrie Ten Boon. Okay, well, have a happy Sabbath and you can go and sit with Mum and Dad again. Um, this song that we're going to sing now might still be new for some of you. We did it last year. Um, so um, what it says to me is the first sentence is, be still, there's a healer. And in the light of what we talked about today in Sabbath school, um, I see the importance in being still. Stop and think for a moment. Pray to God. Talk to him and just know how awesome he is. Um, I think that's amazing. I hope that you want to stand up with me now and sing along. His mercy is unfailing His arms are fortress for the weak Be still, there is a healer His love is deeper than the sea His mercy is unfailing For the weak, let faith arise. Let faith arise. I lift my hands to believe again. You are my refuge. You are my strength. As I pour out my heart, these things I remember.
that came for us, humble to our sinners' cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness. You rose again, victorious. Father in heaven, we thank you for this great message of the gospel that um, we study and we hear and we read about. We, we thank you for the message that you have given us, that you are able to save us. In the state that we are in, and um, it is thrilling to know and understand this message and we, and we thank you for that. We pray that you'll be with Grigo this morning as he brings further to us the knowledge of um, this great gospel message. I pray that you'll uplift him and that um, you will help him as he presents his message to us this morning. We thank you for this church here at Charlestown and what it means to us each individually. It's a place of Worship. It's a place where we can come and um, 
fellowship and we can come and learn more about you. And we thank you so much for this opportunity in, in this church here. We thank you for the children of this church and the young ones. Is, um, they brighten our church and uh, we, we so thank you for them. And our young people, our young people are always very special to us. And to see them singing up the front, to see them taking on um, roles in the church uh, is, uh, lifts our heart with joy. And um, we thank you for their influence to us. I pray that you'll be with those that uh, are not here today. Uh, be with them as they're worshipping elsewhere. And uh, as we make plans for this new year, I pray that you'll guide us and help us um, throughout this year. We have plans for this church, and I, and I ask that you'll help, help these plans to um, come to fruition. And uh, we leave ourselves in your care for the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. All in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath to you and a happy new year. Yeah. It's good to see so many uh, new faces and uh, the familiar faces are still here. We're glad for that. And I trust that you had a wonderful Christmas. I really uh, was delighted uh, to be with family back home in South Africa, connecting with them. We had a lovely break and uh, did some fun stuff. One of the main highlights, besides uh, the sad passing away of Madiba Mandela, the great man of Africa, uh, was an incident where we went into a lion park, we drove our car in, and of course we had the warnings not to put your windows down and so forth. I was tempted to play the video, yeah, but I'll do that next time I preach to show you what happened. But we had the lion jump on our boot. That wasn't interesting, especially for Melanie. <laughs> but my son who was in the other car back of us with my brother-in-law and his family. Uh, he was delighted. He wanted to open the door and come jump on our car, in our car. <laughs> but that was exciting to be uh, in the vicinity, in the area of those ferocious beasts, a lion. Uh, maybe when I preach on Daniel in the lion's den, I'll show you that clip and what it means to be living with lions. But that was one of the highlights, but the other highlight was, as you can see, uh, I've put on some and enjoyed the uh, beautiful food that uh, the family had prepared for the people that came over from Australia. And so, nonetheless, I always tell people, South Africa is the land of my birth, Australia is my home. What do you say? Yeah, and so I'm, good to, I'm glad to be back home worshipping with my family here at Charlestown Church. And I trust that as we move into the year 2014, we will come closer to each other as a family, uh, get to know each one, and also to, uh, in a small way, uh, bring each one, and including myself, closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's the beautiful privilege that God has entrusted me as your pastor to do. Uh, not only uh, to benefit from just a job, but to also be spiritually uplifted because of the folk that I see sitting here. And so if you're a visitor uh, and you're thinking of choosing a church for this year, why don't you check out Charlestown? By the way, uh, I think uh, I want to thank uh, Jeremy for introducing our latest uh, development within our church. Uh, we're live streaming our services, and so that's great. Uh, I got to wear a tie, they say. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> got to be neatly dressed. <laughs> but in any case, uh, I love wearing a tie. So uh, if you ever want to get me a gift, get me a tie, all right? I'm going to try a bow tie next time. 
I always wanted to wear a bow tie and preach and to see how that goes. I was, te- I was a bit, when I heard Pam in uh, deliberations uh, earlier say, uh, oh, Gregor preaches a good sermon. Uh, I was sitting there and I was chuckling and my wife said, oh, the pressure is on. And, 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 Lance, <laughs> and Lance tapped me from the back and says, you, it better be a good sermon. <laughs> But whatever it is, uh, I can assure you that it is going to be a sermon that is worth uh, listening to, and I trust that this little experience will draw us closer to Jesus this morning. Uh, Let us pray before we open God's Word. Father in heaven, we bow in your presence and we thank you for the breath of fresh air, and we thank you for the warm sunshine outside and the coolness of this building inside and the warm smiles and the beautiful people that I have gathered here to worship you. Lord, we come from different walks of life and with different issues and with different anticipations. And Lord, we sit at your feet knowing that you will speak to our hearts. And so whatever I have prepared is not much, but when you touch it, it will be multiplied, I believe. And so, Lord, that we could be fed the heritage of Jacob, and to come closer to our precious Jesus this morning. Be with us now and take full control, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Two men were walking through a field one day when they spotted an outrageous, enraged bull. Instantly, they darted toward the nearest fence, and the storming bull followed in hot pursuit, and it was soon apparent that they wouldn't make it. Terrified, the one shouted to the other, put up a prayer, John, we're in for it. John answered, I can't, I've never made a public prayer in my life, but you must, implored his companion. The bull is catching up to us. All right, panted John. I'll say the only prayer I know, the one my father used to repeat at the table. Oh Lord, for what we are about to receive, make us truly thankful. You know, if there's one sin that is most prevalent today, it is the sin of ingratitude. You know, God God does so much for us. Our indebtedness to Him is enormous. And yet we rarely, or at least infrequently, offer thanks for what He has done. In fact, most professing Christians don't even offer thanks over their meals, much less offer thanks over all that God does in their lives. Uh, we, we are much like that little boy who was given an orange by a man, to which the boy's mother asked, Now what do you say to that nice man? The little boy thought and handed back the orange to that man and said, Peel it. <laughs> you see, for a Christian, thankfulness is not confined to a day or a season. It is an attitude that we should have every day and every hour. Now, to magnify this point, let us turn to our Bibles, to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 17, and examine the account of the ten lepers. And I would like to introduce you to some important truths concerning an attitude of gratitude. That's the title of my message, an attitude of of gratitude. So your Bibles are open to the book of Luke chapter 17. Uh, we'll look at his, this particular gospel. I like the book of Luke. He's uh, noted as a physician, as a medical doctor, but he did more spiritual healing than physical healing. Aren't you happy for those kind of doctors? And there are many doctors in our presence here that I'm sure that do the same offer that encouraging word to their patient and so forth. So we want to look at just this particular chapter, Luke chapter 17, and we will look at verse 11 and 12. I'm going to read it in the old King James Version for whatever reason I'm inspired to read the King James Version. But if you have your own translation, follow along in your Bibles. And my translation reads like this, And it came to pass, as he went to Jerusalem, that he passed through the the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain village, 
There met him ten that men that were lepers, which stood afar off. The first point of this message, particularly the story, is that we see the position of all these people. We see the position of the Alpers. Firstly, they were in an awful position. Luke says they stood afar off. Now, you know, the disease of leprosy was a painful disease. But the physical pain was not the most terrible part of this disorder. Lepers were separated. They were shut out and cast off. It seems here that these lepers were shut out to an area away from everyone else. They were shut out from their families. No one knows how long it had been since they had felt the touch of their wives or the kiss of their children. Shut out from family. They were also shut out from friends. Friends no longer visited or extended the invitation to come home. We're not familiar with that anymore. Shut out of their family, from their family, friends. And they were also shut out from the fellowship of the church. But notice in this introduction of Luke's gospel, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, but he entered a certain village and there met the lepers. You see, the religious crowd had no room for the leprous people. But most awful, they were shut out from the Father's presence. And here I can see Jesus, the only way to the Father, and they stood afar off from Him. Now, you know, sinners are not near to God. They often stand afar off. Uh, And they cannot and will not draw near on their own. Let me ask you a a question. Do you know what kept them at a distance? The law. The law shut them in and shut them out from the crowd. The law set forth the conduct of the lepers. The law said when you pass on the road... On the other side, you scream out, unclean, unclean. You see, sin puts us in an awful position. And they were all in this awful position. But although they were in that awful position, let me introduce to you, they were in an approachable position. Here are these men living shut out lives. But I'm grateful this morning that where the law says, Man cannot go. Jesus goes. What do you say? What the law declares off limits, Jesus barges in. When the law passes on the other side, Jesus makes it a point to make contact. Listen, Jesus came to save sinners. He went this way on purpose because even in that awful position sin puts us in, Jesus is able to reach us and to save us. My family cannot help me. My friends cannot help me. My church cannot help me. But Jesus can. What do you say? And while we stand off from Him, He does not stand afar off from us. When they could not get to Jesus, Jesus got to them. When they could not come into Jesus, Jesus came to them. Now I want us to look at verse 13 and verses 14. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. All ten utter the same prayer. But observe with me two points quickly. They saw and they sensed their need, number one. You know, you don't and I don't pray and call out for help unless you and I feel our need. Would you agree with me? The reason sinners don't come to Christ, the reason why people don't come to God for salvation is that they don't sense their need for Him. 
But the loneliness and pain of this disease were evident to these ten lepers. It's not a good sight to look at a leper. How many of you looked at lepers or worked with the leprosy patients? And Yeah. If you've been on mission trips or if you've been a missionary serving through the church, you know what I'm talking about. They live very sad lives, a way literally shut out from society. And so this loneliness, and not only the loneliness, but the pain that they felt, well, lepers don't feel pain, don't they? But the pain they feel is the loneliness pain. That you're all alone was evident to these ten lepers. They knew they needed help and there was none to be found except maybe in this one person called Jesus. Whom they heard heal the sick. And there's no doubt they need help. And so they cry out for mercy. So they recognize their need. That's point number one. And number two, their obedience. You see, prayer without obedience is useless. Jesus tells them to go to the priest. And now the priest, as we know, had no power to cure anyone. They only had to, or they had the authority to declare the cured clean. And to issue a certificate of cleanliness so that all will be sure of this particular healing. But do you notice, do notice that they were not healed immediately. The text says, when they went, they were healed. As they obeyed the command of the Lord, they were healed. So not only did all pray to Jesus, but Jesus healed also them physically, every one of them. And so what do we make of this? They were in the progress or in the process of being healed until they reach the priest. But that's not what the sermon is going to focus on for these few minutes. I'd like us to focus on verse 15 down to 19, an attitude of gratitude. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? And where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save the stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith had made thee whole. The wholeness of Jesus' power over that individual's life not only healed his physical condition, but restored this man completely. Here's the key to the whole issue. We are all in the same awful position. Like the ten lepers. They were all in that same awful position. All prayed and all were healed. Yet only one of the ten returned to offer thanksgiving. It's amazing, isn't it? I want us to notice the opportunity of praise. One of them, when they saw, when he saw that he was healed, turned back. What happened to the nine? The Bible doesn't say much of it, but I I wish to let our imaginations run for a minute. He saw this particular individual who turned back. He saw a reason to praise God. Question, did not the other nine see a reason also to praise Jesus? This particular one who was healed and returned back to offer thanks, he saw the difference Jesus had made. He saw a change wrought about by Christ. He saw an opportunity to praise God. You see, many see their need to pray, but don't see their need to praise. Uh, And I wonder for us as a church and visitors that have come today, 
for 2014, things may go on smoothly for a few months into the year. But when you come to the point of making those financial burdens and those bills accumulating, and when the trouble starts, would you continue to praise even though we will continue to pray and bring our burdens to the Lord. I don't know how it happened. We are not told here, but maybe as they walked toward the priest's home, he began to notice this patient, notice his skin losing that scaling white appearance. Or maybe they passed by some people and he expected Uh, that person to retaliate and say, get out of here, but nothing happened. I don't know how he came to the conclusion, but when he saw that he was healed, this leper, he stopped going in one direction and made a beeline to see Jesus. He had reason to praise God. What are your reasons to praise God this morning? They all had reason to praise God, but only one saw it fit to go and meet the master. The opportunity of praise. Let's look at the object of praise. Where are the other nine? I'd have no doubt, and you will agree, that after they were declared clean by their priest, they made their way to be with their family and friends. After all, They longed to be in the presence of people that they once knew, that shared food together, had children and so forth, to hug and kiss the wife and the children, to visit mom and dad, to talk with friends. Their minds were occupied on all the blessing brought to their lives, but one. One loved his wife and children just as much as the others. One wanted a hug and a kiss from his wife and children just as much as the others. One wanted to spend time with friends just as much as the others. One wanted to enjoy the blessings just as much as the others. But one had his priorities in order. One did not get so, this particular individual did not get so wrapped up in the blessing that he forgot the blesser. One put family, friends, fellowship on hold so that he could worship the one that made his being with his family and friends possible. I want us to notice that with a loud voice, he glorified God. Uh, Let me just pause to punctuate what I've said. He glorified God with a loud voice. And may I suggest to you, you know, I I don't want to tell you how to worship the Lord, but I think I can encourage you to worship the Lord uh, through your praise. It may not be in the context of the church all the time in a worship city, but maybe at home, maybe with your friends, and we're celebrating life, and you recognize at that point in time how God has taken you out. Give thanks. Shout out a heavenly burst of joy and enthusiasm. Maybe we need to expect these kind of bursts within the church as well. I know it's a cultural issue, but uh, I think we can unlearn a few things that we have always been learned and taught and grew up with. Because when an individual is touched by God, he just cannot keep silent. The Bible says with this particular person, that he praised God with a loud voice. He glorified God. He said, in whatever frame of mind he was, the ecstatic, jubilant, exuberant praise, recognizing Jesus for what he has done. With that same loudness and intensity, he cried for mercy. Lord, have mercy on him. When he first met Jesus coming into that village, it is with that same intensity he praises and he glorifies God. There's a lesson to be learned. Because you have attended a lot of praise and worship workshops. And you may be familiar with worshiping. But
child is, can you hear me? The child is not uh, being too uh, obedient. And we bring that child to the Lord. And, 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 we, and we cry, we pour our hearts out to the Lord. You know where I'm getting at, don't you? And so, uh, I'll protect, I'll protect. And, and we, we, we pour our heart out to the Lord with, with sighs and anguishes and tears. And some of, you, of us who are not in that vicinity, we can just say a cold one. And of course, God do understand that. But what I'm saying is that the same intensity of our pleas to the Lord Jesus should be the same intensity of our praises to his name. We see that in this particular story of giving thanks and praise to the Lord. An attitude of gratitude. Many times we cry loud for help, but low with praise. But with the same zeal we sought help, we should praise Him. And He fell on His face at His feet, giving thanks. He was a Samaritan. Or He was not a Jew. He was not worthy of this healing. He was not worthy to receive God's help. But by grace he was healed and he comes to worship the one who unconditionally healed him. And you know what? He got more than the others did. They received the physical healing from a distance. But this one also received not only received his physical healing, but he got close to God and worshipped him as Lord and received a spiritual blessing. You can be healed at a distance. God can take that burden away and that ailment or that predicament. But one will not receive that complete restorative or spiritual healing only when it is recognized that the blesser has blessed you and you come to a point of humility and self-surrender and with a heart of gratitude or with an attitude of praise and thanks, you recognize that. God may choose to physically heal a man from a distance, but spiritual healing comes only when we fall prostrate before the feet of Jesus Christ and worship him as our savior. His faith did not save him, but it connected him to the one who could save him. So whenever we read these texts, Jesus healed and he pronounced your faith has made you well. Even that faith that we possess doesn't necessarily mitigate the fact that we had some part to play in our healing, in our deliverance, or even in our salvation. Because actually faith is a gift from God. And so that faith now connects us to that person who saves. That is why the Bible teaches when Jesus Christ comes, the text says, shall he find faith on the earth? Shall he find faith? Shall, in other words, shall he find people who will be connected with me? We always get mixed up. Oh, what's going to save me? Is it the faith? You need to have more faith. And if I don't have more faith, it doesn't guarantee. No, no, no. Faith is a measure of God's gift in each one of us sitting here to actuate it. It's like a kickstart to connect me to my Savior. So we thank God for that, don't we? His faith did not save him, but it connected him to the one who could save him. Hallelujah. There was a father and a mother of a young man killed in a military and they worshipped in a little church. One day, they came to the pastor and they told him he, that they wanted to give a monetary gift as a memory to their son who died in battle. 
And the pastor said, that's a wonderful gesture on your part. And he asked if he could announce this to the congregation the next Sabbath. And they said it was. So the next Sabbath, he told the congregation of the gift given in memory of their dead son. And so on the way from church, another couple was driving down the highway when the father said, the husband said to his wife, why don't we give a gift because of our son? And his wife said, but our son didn't die in any conflict. Our son is still alive. And the husband replied, that's exactly the point. That's all the more reason we ought to give thanks to God. What are you thankful for, to God for? Eh? We beginning 2014. Christmas was well, I assume, and of course I heard the passing on of some of our parents, of our members. Uh, but through it all, the attitude of gratitude ought to be evident in our lives. Look back over your life and you can truly testify how God's grace has led you, how he has brought you. I am a testimony to that and I just want to thank God. I praise his name for what he has done and is doing in my life and in the life of my family. And I praise his name for that. And so for 2014, what do I have to say? The first sermon by your pastor. Uh, like I'll always say, I don't have a bag of ideas. Uh, we simply in the hand, you know, we, we, we come with empty hands serving. And it is our privilege to walk hand in hand with you for 2014 as we have this attitude of gratitude always on our hearts, uh, moving ahead for 2014 with God on our side, with understanding that there's nothing we can bring. The, we have no claim over our righteousness except Christ's righteousness. Amen? We have no claim to any righteousness. Save the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so may this year at Charlestown be a, a journey closer to heaven. May we, we start off our year with prayer, with thanks, with exuberance in our praise. Let's make a difference in our church community. Let us do this. For his honor and glory. Because there's nothing really good in us, in me, save the goodness of Jesus Christ. What I've learned from this story, one can make a difference to the heart of God. Maybe they had valid reasons and we all can uh, rationalize and justify the behavior of the nine. But the point is not to look at the nine, but look at the one, and that one represents you and me. That we can turn ourselves back, even in the process of being restored and healed. And the excitement is to go and show and share it and testify to the others, but always never to forget to bring it back to Jesus. Does Jesus and does God need to hear our thanks? Is that an argument? No. No. It is a gratitude that we all possess in our hearts. And we all want to express our thanks. The only culmination of this great event is going to be when Jesus Christ the sec comes the second time. What do you say? I don't know how you are going to respond with thanks to Jesus. But I tell you, I know how I am going to do it. Because I'm going to start practicing for 2014 in this church. How to do it. Many do backflips and somersaults, walk down the aisle. That's all good. And let's not, let's not criticize those people. No, 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 no. They mean well. They're sincere. Some people are sincere. Talking about our brothers and sisters in other denominations. They are sincere. Let us rehearse 
that moment when we lock eyes with Jesus. Oh, some are allowed to just be silent. Wow. I don't know what's going to be like. We are wired differently. The clerics, the sanguines, the what's the other personalities, and all these phlegmatics, clerics, and all these names that we have. I cannot prescribe a a a a, 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 a regimented criteria for us how to express our worship. But one thing we should have is this attitude of gratitude. God bless you. God bless you for 2014. Amen. Praise your name, Lord, for the great things and even for the not so great things. Lord, we just praise your name for life. Thankful that we are alive. We're thankful for the opportunity 
to enjoy you in our lives, to know that you are in control. And so, Lord, there are some may be going through some challenges, but whatever it is, help them to know that despite all of the challenges, we can still praise your name. Um, come close to us, remind us again and again that we are worth it, we are valuable, we are special. Thankful for Jesus, the Prince of Glory. And so, Father, we pause at this time to, to give you our lives and to say thank you. And may we always have an attitude of gratitude to live in the Spirit, to live in that space of being thankful. This is our desire, to remain in that space. And so bless us and dismiss us now with your blessings. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen.